Okay, why don't we begin? Uh, today's speaker is Mike Wiltberger, who I think is known to many people here, but uh, give him a brief introduction. Mike is a Scientist 3 and a Geospace Frontier Section Head in HAO here at NCAR, and he is also Adjoint Assistant Professor in the Department of Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences at CU, and an Adjunct Associate Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Rice University. Uh, Mike received his bachelor's degree in physics from Clarkson University and then his master's and PhD from the University of Maryland in physics and his research focus is on uh, using numerical models to study the interaction of solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere to further our understanding and ability to predict space weather and he will talk today about modeling geospace. So, please go ahead. Thanks Nick. So yes, uh, my uh, topic for today is going to be to spend some time uh, talking to you about the tools and the work that I've done over the past few years to do models of uh, the geospace environment. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of uh, working with a great variety of, of colleagues throughout the years, uh, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge their contributions to, to my research program in general and in, in aspects of this talk in specific. So I've tried to break the talk down into three rough categories for you here today. The first category, since there's a broad spectrum of folks in the audience, is to provide a little bit of a background about um, uh, geospace modeling and its connection to space weather in particular. And then we're going to dive down into the details of the geospace modeling thing and look at three particular aspects of, of the coupling that are present in these coupled models and, and how that tells us about the physics of the dynamic system. We'll look at the coupling from the electrodynamic connection between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere, the coupling within the magnetosphere, how energy is moved from the distant portions of the tail into the inner magnetosphere, and then the most recent work that I've been working on of the mass coupling from the ionosphere out into the magnetosphere and how that affects the dynamics and, and evolution of the magnetospheric system itself. Then we'll wrap up with a little bit of my vision of where I think the future of geospace modeling is going and, and a few conclusions from the, from the talk itself. So we have the advantage of, of working in this space weather field and working in an area that gets a fair amount of media attention because of its connection to impacts on the, on the society that we live in here today. And, and uh, you can get national attention, local attention, and sometimes even people you know show up in media appearances uh, talking about space weather for, for the thing itself. So what is this space weather concept that we talk about? Well, it all starts here on the surface of the sun with uh, typically the ejection of a coronal mass ejection that, that comes out through interplanetary space and can take about two to four days to arrive here at the Earth. When that um, uh, high density, high speed flow arrives at the Earth, if the magnetic fields are oriented in the right direction, you can get energy transferred into the magnetotail that can energize particles and light up the aurora Borealis giving us the, the beautiful northern lights that, that we see in the, in the system itself throughout that, that thing there. And HAO here has a long history of being able to look at uh, the origins of these coronal mass ejections and, and what they do coming into the, to the system itself. To be able to model space, we have to think about and look at um, uh, some spheres, some very important spheres. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I've got to talk a little bit more about the details of the space weather impacts. Uh, the, the space weather impacts come down to our technological systems. One of the biggest areas that's impacted in our uh, technology is, is communications. The HF communications through the ionosphere can be dramatic affected by the changes in the ionospheric density that can impact in turn aircraft operations uh, and also the precision navigation and timing that we do from GPS systems. The current systems that flow associated with these big magnetic storms can change rapidly. The rapid changes in these current systems can affect aspects of the power grid. This is perhaps the thing that gets us the most attention, most media uh, political attention, is the impacts on the power grid and the, the disruptions to, to power grid operations. So we want to be able to have a modeling environment that lets us go after that kind of a system. And to do that, we have to be able to look at all the important spheres that make up the geospace environment. So 
now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the various spheres, including my personal favorite sphere, the magnetosphere, because that's where I've spent most of my uh, adult life doing research. And, and the, the image that you see here on the left is a, is a little video that was actually playing at the very beginning of the talk that we put together to kind of explain what's going on in the magnetospheric system itself. Um, over here on the left would be the sun coming, uh, blowing out its solar wind, and in comes the, uh, the IMF uh, pointed southward, giving us a little burst of reconnection at the day side of the, of the magnetopause that's transferring energy down into the magnetotail, and you get all these different little flow structures moving the magnetic field lines around in the, in the system itself. The sort of time scale for the transfer of energy from the southward turning to this uh, uh, motion in the tail is, is about three hours, typically called a substorm kind of a phenomenon. You chain a bunch of substorms together or actually have the events associated with a big coronal mass ejection, you get into what we call a geomagnetic storming period of activity. These are the, the long protracted things that can, can impact the radiation environment, the, the power grids, the, uh, the communication system itself. And essential to being able to understand the radiation environment is to be able to understand the waves that are present in this system. And some of those waves are generated by the, the beautiful Kelvin-Helmholtz instability that you see occurring along the flanks of the, of the magnetopause that can, can energize particles in the, in the inner magnetosphere. Now, the magnetosphere is, is my uh, favorite sphere, but it's connected to a fair number of, of other spheres, including down here at the bottom of these magnetic field lines, the ionosphere. The ionosphere is uh, the upper levels of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, from a mass perspective, it's a relatively inconsequential amount of the material, you know, order a tenth of a percent or so of the, the mass in the, in the atmosphere. But it's ionized by the sun, the EUV, the X-ray radiations that are flowing in it, turning it into a, a plasma environment. And that plasma environment is where the field line currents, the coupling from the magnetosphere down into the ionosphere happens. It also happens to be the, the big cathode ray tube, if you will, of, of where the electrons coming down on, where you get the aurora to happen, the lighting up and the brightening of the, of the aurora borealis uh, in, in itself from that system there. The ionosphere shares its space with the neutral atmosphere as well. In fact, the upper levels of the ionosphere, or the ionosphere matches up with a region of the, uh, the atmosphere that we, we call the thermosphere. It's called the thermosphere because it's, quote unquote, the hot part of the, of the atmosphere. You can see in this uh, temperature profile over here of the neutral temperature, as we get up in here, the thermosphere is getting, getting hotter. It's hotter because it's pretty rarefied and you're dumping a lot of energy into it from uh, the EUVs and the X-rays, and so you're, so you're heating it up. It's highly variable. These two curves that you're seeing here are actually the variations in the neutral gas temperature over a solar cycle, or excuse me, yeah, solar min to solar max, kind of a, kind of a time frame. And on top of that variability, we can get a fair amount of variability from the space weather effects that come into play that can change the, the density, give us small features, affect the communication uh, aspects of the system itself. So to be able to model and understand the dynamics of the whole geospace environment, we need to put together a modeling framework that combines all of these spheres. And I and my colleagues over the past uh, decade or so have, have built um, uh, what we call the, the, the CMIT modeling ge or CMIT geospace framework, the coupled magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere framework. Uh, for those of you in the audience that are more familiar with the, with the climate world, you can think about this as the CESM of, of geospace. This is our, our uh, drawing of connections and components together to be able to model the geospace environment. The core of that modeling sy system here is the combination of the uh, multi-fluid or the uh, LFM uh, MHD model of the magnetosphere that handles the interaction of the solar wind with the uh, plasma that's present in the Earth's environment in the Earth's magnetic field coupled to um, uh, an electrodynamic solver that solves the, uh, the motion of the ionosphere uh, plasma and the conductivity of the ionospheric plasma at, at, the, at the high latitude region. To be able to get the full dynamics of the, the Earth system in place, we tie that uh, uh, electrodynamic coupling into the thermosphere-ionosphere general circulation model uh, that has uh, been uh, a mainstay of, of uh, modeling activities here at, at NCAR for uh, a long period of time. We feed into it the, the motion of the ions, the energy fluxes coming in, and that gives us back conductivities that we can then use to adjust the potential patterns, the motions of the, of the high-latitude plasma that come into play there. 
And what we've been working on uh, most recently is, is adding another pathway, another coupling pa mechanism in the, in the system itself, and that is the ionosphere polar wind model, to be able to say, okay, what, is the, what are the masses looking like? What are the, how are the ions moving in here? And how can they flow out into the magnetosphere? And what impacts have, do they have on the evolution of the magnetospheric system? Originally, when we developed this core framework, we were just dealing with a single fluid, um, uh, a multi, a single fluid MHD equation. We've, we've worked recently about extending that to be a multi-fluid so that we really could understand this ionospheric coupling and the ionospheric dynamics. So now we'll uh, drill down on the first aspect of the electrodynamic coupling, and that is to look at uh, uh, the electrodynamic coupling, the conservation of current. Essentially, what the electrodynamic coupling between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere boils down to is this one simple equation over here. Um, uh, and that actually, if you break it all down, is just simply current continuity. This is the divergence of the perpendicular current is equal to the parallel current. What comes in must come out from the, from the magnetospheric ionospheric perspective. We're not letting any current dissipate or charges build up in the, in the ionosphere. We have currents flowing down from the magnetosphere across the polar cap and back out the, through what are so, the so-called region one currents. This graphic that I, we made a while back for the Comet program is actually a little bit inaccurate. In fact, most of the closure of the currents happens not over the top of the polar cap, but between the region one and region two currents that are, that are present in the system. These region two currents occurring at lower latitudes, connecting more down into the magneto tail. To be able to, to model this kind of a system, we need to be able to understand what the conductivities are. There are two main contributors to these conductivities that come into play. One is this EUV uh, ionization that's happening from the sun that gives us uh, seasonal and uh, uh, day-night variability in the system. And then the other is enhancements to the conductivity associated with the aurora. For those of you that are in the know, we have an empirical version of the night relationship in there. That's how we do that enhancement modeling in the, in the system itself. For those of you that, that uh, don't know what that means. It just means where we have the strongest currents and where we've got the biggest electrons coming down, we enha enhance the conductivity in, in that region. And then that solution to this gives us uh, a parameter that I've got labeled here as phi, is the, is the cap potential. You can kind of see it being depicted here through these Hall current motions here. It's actually also showing you what the motion of the, of the ionospheric plasma is in this high latitude region. And you'll hear me use the term cross-polar cap potential or convection pattern uh, interchangeably throughout this talk for these kinds of things. And we call it a convection pattern or cross-polar cap convection because it's describing the motion of the plasma from the from the, uh, well, these are actually opposites, from the sunward side going around, coming back, giving us the, the convection uh, of, the, of the system itself there. And it, it's convection because it has that analogy to, you know, the classic physics 101, 102 boiling pot of water kind of churning over kind of thing. We got that naming convention coming into play in that system itself. So on this, uh, to, to probe that electrodynamic coupling, we're going to actually take a look at um, uh, uh, a period of time that was identified by the, the space physics community called the, the International Heliophysical Year. It was part of a, a campaign in, in 2007, which was the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year that, that people may, may recall from that kind of thing. Looking at the evolution of the sun over an entire month, uh, one Carrington rotation, one complete uh, um, uh, motion of the sun, uh, 27 days. And since this was 2007, it was around the time of the last solar minimum. The sun was pretty, pretty quiet. It had a lot of uh, recurring coronal hole structure that was giving us uh, fast and slow uh, solar wind speeds interacting in the, in, the, in the solar wind. And you can see that in, the, in this panel right here. You got solar wind speed coming up, getting, getting higher here in this high speed stream interval and this high speed stream interval here. And I guess I should explain that uh, um, uh, I'm using the, uh, the GSM coordinate systems. Like all good space physicists, I know that the Earth is the center of the universe. And so material coming from the sun is flowing in the negative x direction. So, so this higher negative x velocity is, is, a, is a higher value for, for the solar wind speed coming into play. And you've got this high speed um, uh, following behind a slower wind here, and you get what's called a co-rotating interaction region. You get enhancements in the density at that co-rotating interaction regions. And in fact, some enhancements in the um, uh, uh, magnetic field that co that's coming into play. The magnetic fields here, these are the Y and the Z components of it. The Z component being the one that we think about most being opposite directed to the Earth's magnetic field, but the Y component can come into play, have a little bit of enhancement. 
This is the way that I have looked at solar wind for the 20 some odd years of my career. Um, uh, it has a great deal of utility, but we wanted to think about a way to kind of summarize what was going on in an entire interval. So I created this infographic over here on the left. This infographic actually displays all the information in here in, in, in one um, uh, relatively easy to understand thing here. It looks like a compass. The compass directions are actually associated with the, the northward um, uh, being positive BZ, southward being negative BZ, similarly for east and west for BY. And then I broke it up into eight bins and said around the 45 degree bin around northward IMF, what is the average condition of the IMF in that thing? And it's about, you know, two nanoteslas and it's not quite completely north it's shifted off a little bit from the from the northward direction but we know that it isn't just BZ that's important in driving the geospace response we also have to look at the factors like the solar wind velocity so I colored the arrow intensity with the magnitude of the solar wind velocity so that you can see down here in this uh, southeasternly quadrant got the interval with the strongest um, uh, solar wind velocity and solar wind um, uh, magnetic fields that are pretty comparable to uh, the rest of the time frame that we're going on there. The last little piece of information that's buried in this little infographic is the width of the arrows. The width of the arrow is actually telling you the number of minutes in, the, in this uh, time frame in which the solar wind was actually in that, that binning thing. Doing this analysis, coming up with the pretty little graphic, is more than just a pretty, pretty little graphic. It's the first step in doing a statistical analysis of the results that we're getting out of the simulation. So I uh, want to be able to take a different resolutions of the simulation results and compare them with the statistical analysis. So um, using my Everly creative uh, naming convention, we did three different runs of the, the, the LFM simulation. And essentially, we doubled the resolution in each direction for each of these different run intervals uh, over this period of time. Uh, so that means that actually each, each one of these things is 16 times more work because every time you in increase the, uh, uh, the cell size by a factor or decrease the cell size by a factor of two, your, your time step goes, goes down too. So you need to do more computational effort. To do the whole 27-day uh, full heliosphere interval uh, at, the, at the quad resolution, um, uh, it uh, uh, produced over 20,000 files, 2.5 terabytes worth of data, and a fair amount of um, uh, big data analysis um, uh, work that needs to be done to go after that. And the first step in doing that big data analysis is to use that statistical binning that I talked about for the creation of the infographic to look at what the structures in the latitude currents are in, in the system itself. And so this is results from the quad resolution version of the simulation showing you the, the field aligned current patterns and the cross polar cap convection for the different uh, clock angle directions of, of the solar wind. Here's the, the typical southward configuration where we got convection over across the top of the polar cap and, and return flow uh, at lower latitudes. You can see the strong region one currents showing up there. It's a little harder to see on uh, the, this monitor here, but there is some lower latitude region two currents coming into play. For northward IMF, that reconnection that happens on the day sign is actually moved over into the high latitude regions associated with the cusp and you get an anti-sunward convection and the creation of a NBZ current system that, that's showing up in the, in the system itself. And then for the BY things, you've got an interplay of lobe convection and, convec and, and driving from uh, the viscous interactions that give you a, a convex shaped cell and a circular shaped cell that gives you the motion kind of coming into play for the system itself. The off diagonal elements tend to be a superposition of the, the values for the, for the canonical, canonical directions. And uh, there, there you can see that this one's got a lot of the region one southward motion kind of thing, but a little bit of the, the convex and concave shapes coming into the, to the system itself for that. These patterns uh, are um, uh, very much what we'd like to see from the statistical kind of a representation, um, uh, a pretty good uh, alignment with, with uh, observational uh, perspective. And in fact, let's drill down and look at what's actually happening across the resolutions and the comparison with the data in a bit more detail. 
So for this one, I'm just taking the, the southwest direction kind of a time frame and looking at the changes in the convection pattern and the field line current structures uh, across the resolution and then comparing it with a statistical model of what the field align current patterns are and the convection patterns are, the so-called Weimer 2005 model. And for that um, uh, thing, I just took the, the values that make up the graphic, the IMF strength, intensity, velocity, and plugged it into Weimer and said, okay, that's what the, it should look like on average for that kind of a value for the, for the bin. What you can see pretty clearly is that as we go to higher and higher resolution, the currents are becoming uh, better defined, right? There's very weak um, uh, and ill-defined kind of amorphous region one currents here at the, at the low resolution. And this, in this view, you can't see the region two currents at all. As we go up to higher and higher latitudes, um, you can see the, form, the region two currents starting to show up at, uh, at low latitudes. And that's actually having a pretty dramatic effect on the structure of the convection pattern, right? Without those region two currents present, the uh, solve for the convection pattern is going all the way down to the low latitude boundary, taking up the whole of the polar cap. And the currents are closing completely across the top of the polar cap. As we get better region two representation, that cross polar cap potential is getting shielded, is getting confined to the high latitude region, where we expect it to be from the statistical and the observational sense of, of, of the system itself. So going to the higher resolution is giving us a, a better representation of the convection pattern and the, and the field aligned currents. We get these better region two currents in there showing up there. I want to be able to take this to the next level and try to understand quantitatively what is actually happening to the region two currents. It's a real challenge to take this sort of amorphous region here that can change with where, with latitude and driving and, and across the different resolutions and, and come up with a, a way of, uh, of defining that. So what we decided to do, what I decided to do on that was to exploit a lot of the work that I've done previously in taking and creating tools to analyze the, the data and the output from the simulation in Python and draw upon the big open source community of machine learning people that are out there and do a machine learning uh, application to, to the system and do what's called an unsupervised learning problem i.e., where are the region two and region one currents for, for those of us that are in the, in the magnetospheric system. And so with the, with the clustering tool in the, in the system itself, I feed it in the, the, the current information and say, OK, identify for me which currents are similar to the other currents that are around it. And these are the patterns that come out of that across the different resolutions and the different model types. You can see very clearly here the region one currents uh, showing up in red, the region two at lower latitudes showing up even more in, in, the, in the green thing. Uh, I, to get the faintest of traces of the region two currents to show up in there. I had to actually crank the threshold to knock down a little bit of the noise a little bit lower to get that to happen there. Across the rest of them, I'm using exactly the same, same te technique for all these things there. And that lets me identify the, the region one, region two current systems in, it, in itself there. And even just looking at these graphical region kind of things, I can pretty clearly see some interesting patterns in that the, the, the width of these current systems are getting narrower as you increase resolution, getting a bit closer to the to the widths that are that are coming into into play there and that the extent of the region two currents are, are growing and getting more aligned with where we would be for the for the run for the, uh, the the resolution that we're looking at I could take it to the next level and actually say okay those plots are just telling me where it is I can integrate over that I've identified and look at the total currents that are flowing into these things. So this is the uh, region one currents across the sort of non-northward IMF directions uh, and as a function of resolution and the, the Weimer model showing up there. And you can see that the currents are increasing slightly, pretty much the same ratio across the different directions as you go up to um, uh, uh, higher resolution and are getting closer to the um, region one current ranks that are seen. The most dramatic changes are actually happening over here in the region two currents. And that is that as we go up from the, the, the single to double, there's a little bit of an increase in the current strengths there. But it's really at this uh, quad resolution where we've got enough resolution to understand the structures of the, of the distribution of the pressure in the inner magnetosphere to well resolve that region two current systems. It's getting close, but probably not quite to the values that are um, uh, seen in an empirical modeling sense. But we're bringing that ratio of region one to region two currents more in alignment with the expectations of what the observations should tell us it should be. So 
I can also look at coupling that happens from a different perspective, and that is the coupling in the magneto tail. Um, the uh, early, eh, early-ish observations, early in my career observations of, of flows in the in the uh, magneto tail, um, uh, done by uh, Los Angelopoulos in the in the 90s, looking at uh, data from the AMT and IRM missions, was noticed that there were these time frames and these these flows that were that were uh, uh, fairly intense and fairly short lasting. So they he coined the term bursty bulk flows to describe how the uh, there's a of uh, flow in the in the magneto tail, they have a peak velocity of around 600 kilometers a second, a few um, uh, minutes in in duration, and associated with these peaks in the flow velocity are changes in the magnetic field and actual dipolarization of the magnetic field, turning the field from its stretched configuration to a more di dipolar configuration happens into it there. Looking a little bit uh, more after they did this initial uh, bit of work, they looked at the, uh, the the distribution and the statistics of the of the BBFs and found that, that these flows are actually the way that the the magneto tail chooses, or the way the magneto tail moves most of the energy, most of the magnetic field, most of the mass density around in the system itself. So they're a fundamental part of being able to understand the dynamics of the the geospace system. And that uh, was where the BBF uh, state of the art was for a fair uh, amount of time until um, uh, 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 the launch of the Themis mission. The Themis mission was a constellation of, of spacecraft. It had five spacecraft that were designed to have their orbits overlapping in such a way that you could get coverage of the spacecraft from the outer magneto tail down into the inner magnetosphere, which would allow you to do exactly what it was designed to do and to track the motion of a uh, flow front from the distant magneto tail into the inner magnetosphere. Here you're seeing a, the, the, this peak in BZ propagating from this spacecraft out here down in the tail down into the inner magnetosphere uh, around 10 RE or so where it, it, it breaks and, and, and stops. Uh, the, they were looking at a particular aspect of this thing and the dipolarizing nature of it. So like all good physicists, they came up with yet another name for it. They call it the, the dipolarization front that you can think about that as sort of the leading edge of the, the BBF in process itself. So I wanted to know, wanted to see what capabilities the simulation has for reproducing this kind of a process in the, in the simulation results. So we cranked solution up yet again by a factor of two in, in all of the directions from the from the quad resolution run that we were looking at and looked at the dynamics of the system for relatively simple southward turning of the of the interplanetary magnetic field this uh, panel here is uh, showing you uh, the interaction of the Earth's magnetic field in the background where the uh, dipole magnetic field has been subtracted off uh, and so the sun's over here, it's blowing the solar wind in on this side, and you can see that there's a compression of the magnetic field on the day side, and a bit of a stretching here on the, on the night side of the, of the, uh, of the, of the a field away from the, the dipolar value. Shown in the, in the magneto tail itself is a vector field showing you, telling you what the direction and strength of the flows are in the magneto tail. I've chosen to not only give you the intensity of the, the flow with the length of the arrow, but also color coded it with this black body radiation color table here. So the reds and blacks are stronger, more intense flows that are coming on in deployment. And then the last thing that we see here is this little blue contour. This is the BZ equals zero contour for the idealized no tilt configurations that we're doing here. You can think about it that as a proxy for where the open closed magnetic field boundary is going to be, where you could potentially have magnetic reconnection going on. So we'll let this play into the system here itself. You can see the southward IMF coming into play, the onset of the Kelvin Helmholtz instability along the flanks. We're about a half an hour into the sequence here. We're loading the energy into the magneto tail. And about 5 o'clock or so, we're going to start to see the first of these flow bursts coming in, moving um, uh, magnetic flux into the magneto tail, originating uh, along this BZ equals zero contour with a fair degree of temporal and spatial variability. And about two hours after the uh, onset of our, the imposition of our southward IMF, the, the magnetosphere has fallen into uh, a state that we commonly refer to as a steady magnetospheric convection interval in the simulation. The energy being input on the day side is being roughly balanced in a dynamic equilibrium kind of a sense with the energy that's being dissipated on the night side in the, in the magneto tail.
Rather than show you the movie one more time and try to be able to pause at all the, the key prime time moments, I uh, just grabbed a few frames from the simulation itself. Here is that, that early time frame where we're still loading energy into the system and there isn't much evolution going on in the in flows. Uh, at five minutes after five, we can see this, this propagation of a flow burst into the inner magnetosphere, fairly narrow in extent. And at the leading edge, you can see this dipolarization front, this, this com um, uh, compression of the field that has a kind of a convex shape at the leading edge of these things. As we get into the full evolution of the system here, we got multiple fronts going off, uh, multiple uh, flow channels that have propagated into the system. Pretty dynamic variability here in the, in the magnetotail. tail. And even when we get into this rough, steady balance there, there's still amount of variability and in, 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 uh, oscillations in the, in the nature of these flows that are, that are coming into play in the system itself. So let's drill down. Let's look closely at what's going on for this flow here uh, around 5 o'clock in the, in the magnetotail. Uh, the one big advantage that I have in the simulation world, being a simulation god over, over the um, uh, observing community is that I can put my satellite exactly where I want, when I want it to be there, uh, and um, not have it have to obey Kepler's laws. In other words, I can just pick data out from, from uh, individual little points in the, in the simulation domain. And I know that this flow burst is actually going to come along this channel here, so I've taken to pick six points along this, this, this y equals a seven and a half line and let the flow come in and see what happens as the, the, uh, the, the system propagates down along those, the BBF propagates down along those lines. It's evolving through its impact into the, into the system passing past the, the various extraction points. This panel just uh, shows you the, um, uh, the uh, velocity in green, the uh, magnetic field profile in white, and the density in, in yellow as we go from the distant portion of the magnetotail down into the inner magnetosphere. And I think it should remind you vaguely of that uh, dipolarization front plot that I was showing you from the Themis data. You can see the formation of this, this, this front, this compression of the magnetic field uh, propagating from about minus 40 down into about minus 25. It has a phase speed of about 300 kilometers per second. It's being followed by this enhancement of flow. And actually, we're also seeing a decrease in the uh, plasma density after the passage of this flow that's coming into play there uh, when, you, when you see what we're going on there. I've tried to be very careful when I've been pointing at this thing to focus on these points and these plots right in here. When I first looked at this, I actually drew my line this way and did it down to this guy. And then I'm like, wait a second, what's going on here? Why am I seeing a second bump in this, in this um, uh, flow here around the 25 RE at a point in time? So let's go back and look at the, uh, the, the, the sequence in a bit more detail. So this is the flow at uh, 5 um, uh, UT or so. And the flow is pretty much almost all earthward here. You can kind of see it's going a little bit off uh, the axis and coming back into it there. But it's, it's earthward through this BZ equals 0 line coming into play. Uh, a minute and a half later, right around the type, the, the, the position of this uh, green satellite extraction point, you can see that we've actually had the onset of a new burst of reconnection going into play. You can see flow coming tailward from this region and a new burst of flow coming, coming uh, earthward and actually a little bit towards the, the uh, x-axis that, that comes into the system itself. And in fact, that's what we're seeing right here is the, uh, the driving of this new dipolarization front from the onset of the, of the reconnection, giving us this thing that steepens up, gives us a density uh, drop there, and, the, and, the, and the, vo the velocity, since it's coming, starting in fairly close to the Earth, is getting braked pretty, pretty quickly. And note that we can also see the, the tailward consequences of this, right? This reconnection happens somewhere in, in here, and we can see that there's a tailward flow, a flow going out, a burst of flow coming out of that reconnection, going down the tail, ejecting stuff out into the system itself. So I was really encouraged when I saw and was able to, to do this analysis that we have features in the simulation that are showing up that are looking a lot like what the observations are showing us. But you know, maybe it's just happenstance. Maybe I picked the one good little time frame. Can I do this in a more statistical kind of a comparison? So to be able to do that, we wanted to make a comparison between uh, the simulation results and some work that builds upon the, the early work that uh, Basley Yunus did uh, using the Geotail spacecraft that was led by, by Shinotani. 
Basically, Shin took the entire satellite mission, took the, time, took the space in the magneto tail, and said, OK, I'm going to use some criteria to define when there's going to be a, a high speed flow. Uh, and I'm going to do that in these idealized solar wind configuration simulations, uh, gaining the advantage of, you know, I get coverage everywhere all the time to make the statistical comparison work. To do that, I wanted to apply exactly the same selection criteria that Shin did for his identification of the, of the BBFs. And, and pretty simply, what he was doing is he was looking for, for time frames in which the flow was greater than 300 kilometers per second, um, uh, and then uh, defined the start of his epoch as the, as the first time point at which the flow was less than 100 kilometers per second. So this complicated structure right here is only going to show up once in the, in the statistical analysis, because while the flow dropped, it didn't drop below the initial threshold to be back to being sort of quiet, isolated kind of a time frame. And throughout the couple of hour time frames, at this point, I'm able to identify four or five um, uh, of the BVFs. Do this over the whole, the whole simulation domain, over the whole um, uh, uh, time frame, and I'm able to build up a superposed analysis comparing the results of the detail observational study to the extraction from the LFM data from a point just above the middle of the, of the plasma sheet in the, in the system itself. For the first two panels here, these, the, the comparisons are being done on exactly the same um, uh, scale for the, for the axes. You can see pretty clearly that this has got a peak of about 300 kilometers per second. We have a similar peak. Uh, our tail is a bit broader here in the, in the simulation results. And also notably is this uh, feature here of an enhancement in the flow that's happening before the, uh, the start of the, the epoch time that is not showing up at all in the, in the simulation results. We think that this is because these are reflected ions off that front. It's a non-MHD kind of effect, so we don't see that in our MHD simulation. And if we were to do a, a, a particle simulation interacting with these flows, we should be able to capture some of that, that feature coming into play. In looking at the magnetic field, uh, what we can see is that we've got a bit stronger in intensity in the, in the magnetic field. Again, our profile's a little bit, little bit broader. But the, the essential features of this peak in BZ associated with a decrease in, in BX at the, at the time of the front is happening there. And it's also a dipolarization front in the sense of this field here is stretched, as noted by the differences between the, the BX and the BY. And then they're getting pretty comparable over here, being more dipolar. And we're seeing a reduction, not quite as the same magnitude, in the, in the post uh, configuration after the front passes to, through the system itself. Then the last aspect of the comparison is the, is the density. How's the density changing as this BBF dipolarization front is propagating through the system here? And morphologically, these features look pretty much the same, right? We've got a density that's higher here, dropping down to a lower value after the front passage. And we're seeing that same kind of a morphological feature in the, in the simulation results. But uh, the axes are dramatically different here in the, in the system itself, right? This is a, you know, a few uh, uh, hundredths of a, of a change. This is a few tenths of a change change, a pretty dramatic difference for the system itself. And what we think is the origin of the difference for this uh, portion of the analysis is that I'm dealing with an idealized configuration, and I preconditioned the magnetosphere to create a really dense plasma sheet at the beginning of the time frame. And so I'm comparing the results uh, for that dense plasma sheet to the typical values for the plasma sheet over all the, all the portions of the magneto tail. And so we're seeing a much more dramatic impact in, the, in those results. So the last uh, aspect of the coupling that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is the mass coupling. Uh, uh, in, the, uh, coup in the way that we had been typically doing uh, simulations or connections between the uh, Earth's magnetosphere and ionosphere, we were ignoring any of the ability of the mass to flow through the low latitude, excuse me, the low altitude boundary of the uh, of the magnetospheric domain, typically placed about an RE or so above the surface of, of the Earth. And then there's the ionospheric solve that's happening down here close to the Earth in a few hundred, maybe five or six hundred kilometers in, in, in altitude. And there's a region between the, the top of the ionosphere and the bottom of the magnetosphere that wasn't really being simulated, the so-called gap region in the in the simulation domain. 
we know, we've known for a long time that there's flow of material coming out of the ionosphere down into the, into the magnetosphere through the, through the polar wind. Um, uh, and, and we weren't including that in the, in the simulation domain. In fact, the, uh, the boundary conditions that we were using in the, in the magnetospheric simulation were essentially a hard wall, that the ions coming in here were just bouncing out, bouncing off back through there, and there was no flow coming in from, from, the, from the interior of that with, of course, the specification of the, the motion of the high-latitude plasma being mapped up along the, along the field lines. To be able to allow inflow into the magnetosphere or outflow from the ionosphere, depending on your, your perspective, uh, we need to be able to specify some fundamental pieces of information for, for the system. In particular, we need to be able to do the, the real estate thing. We need to be able to say where, location, 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 is the outflow going to be, to be happening. And once we know where the outflow is going to be happening, since I'm doing an MHD simulation, I need to be able to specify the MHD plasma parameters. I need to be able to say what the density is, what the velocity is, what the temperature is of that, of that, of that plasma that, that's coming out of, of the system itself. Now, those are actually somewhat a little bit challenging because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the observational stuff is actually presented in terms of a mass flux as opposed to giving me the velocity and, and density components of it that come into play. So, one, the, one of the first examples, one of the first things we did to try to look at outflow was to concentrate on O plus ions that are flowing out of the ionosphere into the, into the magnetosphere. And, and once we had finished the development of the, of the multi-fluid uh, version of the LFM, I pioneered some work here looking at outflow coming from, from the cusp, the, 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 the region here associated with the, the um, uh, higher fluxes and, and, and convergence of the field lines in the, in the magnetosphere and identified a set of cells in the ionospheric domain and said, okay, I'm just going to create some outflow to come out of that region and flow down into the, into the magnetosphere. What impact does this have on the, on the system itself? This animation is going to show you that variability. The panel on the, on the left is giving you the, the simulation without any outflow, what happens in the typical kind of a configuration. And then the panel on the right is the same solar wind conditions, the same time frame with that cusp outflow turned on. And then I've got a set of field lines that are drawn along in here to help you understand, see what's going on with the dynamics of the, of the magneto tail. If I put this into motion, you can see that we get this plasmoid release, this first substorm onset coming into the, into the simulation without any outflow. And it falls into that steady magnetospheric convection interval that we saw in the high resolution simulations, where we've got a rough balance between the day side and the night side. But let's turn our attention now over to what happens when we turn on the outflow. With the outflow turned on, we get that first substorm as usual, no big changes there. The outflow hasn't come in to impact it. But with the uh, higher flowing oxygen coming into the region where magnetic reconnection is occurring, it's disrupting the ability of that system to come into equilibrium and giving us a second uh, onset of, uh, of a substorm, as you saw through that release of the, of the plasmoid itself. Dynamic indications that having ionospheric outflow in the simulation is essential to getting the dynamics of the, the, the evolution of the geospace response correct. It is sensitive to what the, the characteristics are of, of the outflow. What speed is it coming from? How, how much is it outflowing into it? If it's too slow, it lands way far into the, into the magneto tail and doesn't do much. If it's too fast, it goes out, lands farther and the reconnection region doesn't impact the, the dynamics of the system. But an early indication that we, what we were seeing was that this was going to have a really profound change on the, on the system itself. So working with uh, my uh, colleagues at Dartmouth College, Col Dartmouth College, sorry, uh, and, and the team of really amazing and productive grad students, we, we pushed on with this and said, OK, what can we do to make uh, answer the question of where and when that outflow is occurring more um, dynamic uh, with, the, with the evolution of, of the system? And uh, so uh, Oliver Brambles and Bin Zhang working with uh, um, uh, uh, Bill Latko and John Lyon and myself worked on creating this, this infrastructure for, for studying outflow. Observationally, we know or we knew that there was a pretty strong correlation between where and when the outflow was occurring and magnetic energy coming down from the, from the magnetosphere down into the upper levels of the ionosphere. Uh, as by the, the pointing flux, both in a uh, AC and a, in a DC sense. So um, 
Bill is at the engineering school, so we took a very much an engineering approach to this solution and said, okay, that correlation is enough. Let's see if we can use that correlation to tell us something about how the system is responding. We uh, filtered the magnetic fields that are coming in, used that to identify the regions where um, uh, there was uh, enhanced pointing flux, got that to be the location that we were going to have the outflow coming on, used some empirical relationships to turn that uh, flux out into um, uh, parameters for, for outflow and let that impact the evolution of the, the system. And uh, Oliver uh, was able to do some studies for steady solar wind conditions that we were looking at before and um, uh, published results in science as a grad student uh, with ma the word magnetosphere in it. For those of you that, that do our kind of stuff, getting the word magnetosphere published in science is, is an achievement alone. Doing it as a first author grad student is a testament to the quality of the students that, that were able to work there and the importance of this result coming into play. And that is that with the, without the outflow, we we're looking at the inclination angle of the magnetic field near geosynchronous orbit, just another way of measuring the, the periodicity there. We don't really see any, any periodicity in it. With the outflow turned on, you see this oscillation coming into play here in the, in the evolution of the system. This is a referred to in the observational world as a, as a uh, sawtooth oscillation or sawtooth mode of, of, the, of the magnetosphere. And we're seeing that for the first time in these simulations with a, with a feedback loop in the, in the system, right? Where we get the uh, uh, onset of reconnection, creating that plasmoid, sending electromagnetic energy down into the, into the ionosphere. That uh, is leading to uh, outbursts of new ion flowing out that disrupts the equilibrium that gets you another uh, injection kind of point coming into play. And equally intriguingly, the, the periodicity of the, of the sawtooth is dependent on the intensity of the outflow. This, this uh, outflow pattern here that you see, or this pattern here you see in red, is for outflow that is less intense and giving us a longer period for the um, uh, sawtooth oscillations in the system itself. We've made that prediction. Uh, unfortunately for us, there aren't any spacecraft in the key region right now measuring the outflow, letting us look at what we want to be able to do to go after it, to tease that out. But it's certainly a, a testable portion of the hypothesis that there's a connection between outflow and the sawtooth periodicity. Take that to the next level, what we were trying to do, what we were looking at doing is um, uh, create a more sophisticated and more physics-based version of the ionospheric outflow. And so working with the uh, postdoc here, uh, uh, Roger Varney, who's now gone on to SRI, and the collaboration with uh, uh, Ben and Oliver and Bill, we, we, we've implemented the ionosphere polar wind model, the IPWM. As a, as a mechanism for doing the, the first principles modeling of the, of the gap region, what's happening in that, in that region from the, uh, the top levels of the ionosphere out into the, into the magnetospheric domain. And we've got uh, a technique, a multi-fluid technique, for being able to track both the thermal and non-thermal portions of the, of the ions. And we can uh, promote the, the thermal ions in the ionosphere up into uh, non-thermal accelerated stuff by a empirical parameterization of the, of the wave particle uh, uh, interaction by ion cyclotron resonance heating. I guess I should be spilling all these things out. I have the broad brand ELF, ELF um, uh, waves that are, that are coming to play. Essentially, the much more sophisticated first principles version of what we were doing in the engineering fix, where there was pointing flux coming in, there's heating and outflow of the, of the plasma coming out into the system. So we did a uh, simulation with the full uh, coupled uh, polar wind model, the multi-fluid version of the, of the simulation domain, and, and look at, at the dynamics of the system here. So a plot here in the, in the upper right-hand portion of it is showing us what the, what the flow structure is going to be like, and also where there is O plus ions coming into play. Down here is a parameter uh, showing us the nature of the oscillations, the open polar cap flux, kind of a similar thing to the uh, uh, similar measure of the periodicity as the, uh, the geosynchronous response coming into play. And then two panels over here showing us where the electromagnetic energy is being put into the system and where the O plus ions are coming out of the system. And this is from, from work that Roger and I and Co. got published late last year. 
uh, and the first uh, ion outflow simulations to show, in a coupled sense, this periodicity, this sawtooth oscillation. So here's our first uh, substorm coming up onto here. Uh, you can see the plasmoid being ejected down the tail, and then the burst of outflow coming into play, and a new plasmoid being formed. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on in this perpetual uh, sawtooth oscillation kind of a mode for um, uh, these steady solar wind conditions uh, that, that were coming into play. A uh, completely different approach to modeling the impact uh, or, the, uh, or the outflow process, but having a very similar dynamic response in the system, giving us more credibility that, that, that there's a, there really is a connection between the outflow and the sawtooth oscillations in the, in the magnetosphere. So where I think we're going to be able to go now with the, the simulations in, in these things is, is taking the CMIT modeling framework to the next level and creating what I what would call the, the whole geospace model. The, the, a lot of the elements that you saw in the CMIT framework are, are showing up here with some, some notable extensions and, and replacements. We've got the, the, uh, the multi-fluid version of the LFM. But we need to be able to have an electrodynamic solver that can work not only at high latitudes, but all the way down to the equator to be able to handle the coupling with a, a, a higher resolution, more sophisticated version of the ionosphere thermosphere system, uh, the, the Wacom X model that we'd like to be able to, to plug into the system itself. We have the polar wind model being in here, and there's also showing you a connection between the polar wind model and the ionosphere thermosphere model. We know that there's a fair degree of variability in the in the plasma down there at the lower um, portions of these foot points in the in the ionosphere. How does the variability on that end of the field line, not just associated with the electromagnetic flux, but the density association at that point, change the dynamics of the outflow into the system there. There are also important limits in, in, in beginning that coupling, coupling in there on how intense the outflow can actually be in the system itself. And then there's this other little box over here in the upper right-hand corner that I haven't talked at all about in the, in the, in the work so far, but it has been work that we've been engaged in. And that is to be able to get a better representation of the physics in the inner magnetosphere through coupling something like the Rice convection model in, into the system itself. That will give us uh, even more improvements on the region two currents that are essential for understanding the electrodynamics of, of the system. So a comprehensive whole geospace model would cover all of geospace uh, from the pole to the equator to the other pole with all the electrodynamics. It wouldn't have any gaps in the, in the spatial regions that it, would, that it would be covering. It would be allowing for material to flow out of the ionosphere into the magnetosphere and vice versa for, from that kind of a capability and can prevent, provide some, I think, additional and capabilities for making uh, advanced space weather predictions and space climate kind of uh, predictions. So to sort of wrap up, I'll give you a little summary of uh, what I've been able to, to talk to you a bit about today. Uh, I thought with the, the analysis of the whole heliosphere interval that you're able to see how we can do statistical analysis of the simulation results and that the increases in resolution are bringing the simulation results into better agreement with observations, empirical models of, of the system. And in particular, even without a ring current model in there, the higher resolution lets us get better region two currents and uh, go after it from a better system there. It's also a really exciting data set that we're making available to the, to the broader community to go after and look at um, uh, uh, comparisons of magnetometer analyses, uh, variations in the ionospheric structure over a long period of time and, and can, get a, can be a, an interesting test bed for those kind of analysis points of times. The simulations also do a really good job of being able to capture the dynamics and the connection from the mid-tail region into the inner magnetosphere. And with looking at the simulation results that we can show uh, that the origins of the bursty bulk flows uh, are connected to uh, the, the sporadic and patchy nature of uh, magnetic reconnection in the, in the magneto tail. And I, for one, am really excited for MMS, the Magnetosphere Multiscale Mission, to stop looking at the dayside boring portion of the, of the magnetosphere and get over into the magneto tail, where this dynamic BBF magnet reconnection interplay is going on and can give us another touchstone for looking at the uh, observational system itself. And then 
the most exciting stuff in, in recent time has been this seed change in how we do coupling of the, of the geospace modeling system, and that is including the outflow of ionospheric mass into the magnetosphere. And at least in our simulations, we know that this provides a dynamic change in the structure and response of, of geospace, and therefore is essential to being able to have a robust space weather forecasting system. And I leave you with a picture of a penguin that I took on my most recent trip to Antarctica. I kind of think of myself as the little penguin on a, on a firm foundation looking off into the bright new snowy future of, of, of geospace modeling. All right, it was contrived. <laughs>
the, the key, the other aspect of your question that you were asking about what do I think the key data sets are, what are the key unknowns in the system? From the look at the electrodynamic coupling and, and going into that into more detail, there is this issue that, that in the simulation results that we have, we have a tendency to over predict the strength of the cross polar cap potential patterns. But our field aligned current patterns are spot on, uh, especially when we do comparisons with things like Ampere. But the, uh, well, how do you get, how do you get, how does that disparity happen? Well, there's that other piece of information in there. What is the ionospheric conductivity? And that, knowing that globally and at a pretty high time resolution is a real essential key fundamental piece of observational information that we need to be able to bring in to adjust and take the models to the next level in that system. If you, if you look at uh, output from, you know, you guys' favorite model, the space weather modeling framework, um, you'll see that they get the cross polar cap potential pretty close to spot on. But go look at their field of line current strengths and make a comparison to Ampere. They're a factor of two or three too low in the, in the Ampere results there. What's the difference? What's the unknown? I think it's the conductivity and understanding that conductivity is the key next generation of being able to move things forward in the simulation domain. Thanks. Yeah, it was, it was really excellent. Uh, with When you were showing the the sawtooth yep. oscillations that that were there as a result, or partly because of the ionospheric ion outflow, at at that time, during those times, are are you roughly getting the plasma sheet densities correct, and and what fraction of that is coming from the ionosphere, and does that mean that you're getting the solar winds contribution to the plasma sheet roughly correct? So. Um, I, I, ha we, I don't know that we looked specifically at a comparison of the, of the uh, plasma sheet density in these particular intervals because they're kind of contrived solar wind conditions for, for what we're looking at there. But what I can say is that without the ion outflow in there, if I do a long storm time simulation, I know that the densities that I have in the magneto tail in my plasma sheet are way, way too low. I, they, they don't hold up well to it there because I don't have a really good mechanism for repopulating the, the plasma sheet. It's being blown down the tail by the plasmoids, the other things that are going on. So getting that outflow into there is, is, is an important aspect of it. One of the things that'll be interesting to look at with the whole geospace model is is a is exactly that with the ring current in there, we with the outflow going on, where is most of the energy that's in the ring current plasma coming from? Is it during the peak of a storm time from the O plus ions, as would be seeming to be indicated from the observations? Do the simulations reproduce that? That's the next level kind of question that we can go after with a, with a whole geospace model. Uh, Mike, you mentioned that you're using machine learning to identify region one, region two current, and just curious how that different from a setup using the simple cutoff threshold and look at the priority. So, so, uh, so. You know, looking at a cutoff, cutoff threshold works pretty well if you've got only one data set, right? But I can't do a cutoff threshold uh, across the different resolutions that I'm looking at because that threshold would have to be different. And therefore, I'm putting in a, a rather arbitrary decision process into my comparison. So I wanted something that was going to work across the, the variations of the resolutions and the different sources. So that's why I went for a, a, a more arbitrary machine learning approach to, to, to go after it from that perspective. Another way people think about doing it is to just you know pick some arbitrary contour and look at the strength of the currents along some ar arbitrary latitude, look at the strength along that latitude. But the currents were moving a little bit in space, and there could be a different region. So where, how do I pick that, especially when I'm trying to compare across Weimar and, and, and the LFM results that have them at slightly different latitudes? Now, there's a whole you know consequence of what is the algorithm clustering algorithm doing to do the identification of that? And that's where my, you know, my one human eyeball came in and said, yeah, okay, that looks like what I, the kind of pattern I would expect, and I can, I can go forward with it from, from there. there. There were some clustering unsupervised learning results that looked pretty wacky that I didn't, that I didn't try to use. Any more questions? If not, we thank Mike again. Thank you all for coming.